This is on a Prius this week. It looked at uh, intergroup contact and social social change motivation uh, across different countries. So to kind of begin this, uh, Anapriya noted that kind of as research on intergroup contact and social change motivation becomes more salient, um, this paper looks at kind of the combination of these two variables uh, in the context of the Zurich intergroup project that targets 23 countries. Um, and so the, the representativeness of a large sample typically gives more nuanced and culturally detailed results to the question and the inclusion of a needs based model um, makes it theoretically novel and so utilizing a design of four, di four different studies and drawing on the needs based model of reconciliation, the authors theorize that when inequality between groups is perceived as illegitimate. Disadvantaged group members experience a need for empowerment and advantaged group members need a need for acceptance. Um, and so that's kind of what these research kind of gets us into these research questions here. Um, and specifically, Anapriya noted the hypotheses um, that were used in the study, which were, one, uh, intergroup contact will be negatively associated uh, with support for change among the disadvantaged and then positively among the advantaged groups. And for disadvantaged groups, the extent to which intergroup contact satisfies the need for empowerment will be associated with higher support for social change. And then for advantage group members, the extent to which intergroup contact satisfies the need for acceptance will be associated with higher support for social change. Um, so it's acceptance um, versus the need for empowerment kind of between those two. Uh, and so the methods of the study were, uh, they had the first study, um, there was a sample of 689 members of ethnic minorities from this Zurich intergroup project data set um, chosen because they reported having at least some intergroup contact with the respective majority group and for whose minority group there are at least 100 observations available. Um, and then the final skills and items here were assessed on a seven point Likert scale. The authors used five different oper operationalizations uh, of the construct support for social change. Um, they also used five different oper man, like this word, operationalizations uh, of the intergroup contact construct. And then they had this second study administered to 3,382 LGBTQ participants. Um, study three utilized 2,937 participants from ethnic majorities, uh, white people in Brazil, non-Muslims in Germany, or non-immigrant Chileans in Chile. Um, and then they had the fourth study, which utilized 4,203 cis heterosexual individuals. Um, and I'd like to get a little more deeper probably into what those methods are about. So I'll examine that, um, the original study in a second. Um, but we'll go into the results uh, initially that find that intergroup contact is compatible with efforts to promote social change when group specific needs are met. Thus to encourage support for social change among both disadvantaged and advantaged group members, it is essential that intergroup contact interventions also give voice to and empower members of disadvantaged groups. Um, the two studies of disadvantaged groups, which were the ethnic minority members in study one and then the sexual and gender minorities in study two, support the hypothesis that after accounting for the effects of intergroup contact and perceived illegitimacy, satisfying the need for empowerment during contact is positively related to support for social change. And then as for the two studies that with advantage groups, um, the ethnic majority members in study three, and the cisgendered heterosexual individuals in study four, accounting for illegitimacy and intergroup contact, the authors found that satisfying the need for acceptance and also empowerment is positively related to support for social change. And Anapriya related this to the workplace uh, in two ways. One being that uh, it's important to meet employee needs. Um, managers in each department can make extra efforts to ensure they are paying attention to employees' needs and that they have the space to communicate such needs. Um, this can come in the form of weekly check-ins um, that can include a more proactive approach of such communication and can build more comfort uh, for such conversations. And then uh, having frequent support available for minority groups. Um, diversity and inclusion initiatives can be used to strengthen through can be strengthened through focus group discussions or the creation of identity specific groups that can make these groups feel like they truly belong in their unique history and challenges are appreciated. Plenty of companies have started doing this for LGBTQ employees over the past year. Um, and then Anapriya noted that we offer um, a DEI training called Moving from Identity 
uh, to humanity um, as a kind of plug in here. So um, I think this is an important, uh, interesting study and um, kind of reminds me a little bit of the importance of, um, it relates, I think, to some of the studies that we've had in the past on identity and the importance of both having your own, ha having your own identity and then also being able to relate to others and having some sort of superordinate identity and finding kind of the balance between both of them in order to have a inclusive, um, but also uni unified environment at work. So interested to hear what you all think. And I'll look at this study as well to see kind of what the methods were, because I'm more interested in that. I mean, it makes sense from a basic needs perspective and kind of like just extrapolating this out to, you know, looking at like an interpersonal conflict between a manager and its direct report or something, you know, where there's an obvious sort of power dynamic. And it's like, I, I can, I can, I'm like reminded of certain like situations where, you know, certainly the, the direct report needed a place to feel like their voice was being heard and like they're actually the, their their ideas and their perspective and their experience was also being considered you know and so that was empowering in some way and then and then the supervisor uh feeling like they were being respected as a leader in some way and that feeling of like okay i'm i'm being accepted and respected as the leader gives me a chance to open up a space to be more inclusive and to hear mm -hmm. So I think like, so those, so those two needs are being, you know, so ex feeling accepted as the, as the, as the boss um, and, and then the other person, you know, direct report feeling uh, like they have a place to really get heard and they're, that, and to be considered. So anyway, that seems to make sense on an interpersonal level too. I like the, um, this was out of Prius, right? Um, yeah, I, I like her her takeaways just because I think it points to the need for both like support doing some type of you know um, like this is kind of the creation of identity specific groups that can um, you know sort of a acknowledging um, and 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 paying like extra support so to say for minority groups but but simultaneously bringing bringing them all together so like there needs to be that balance between not just you know oh well we're all one so let's just you know hey why can't we just all like look at the humanity you know with, without also giving um like illustrating acceptance and empowerment for different um, kind of subgroups, sub identity groups within the team. Like, I think that there needs to be that balance of both because without it, then you're not necessarily illustrating acceptance, like, or I should I say empowerment. I think the empowerment piece would be missing if you didn't have. Um, more, you know, like this one saying, like plenty of companies have started doing this for LGBTQ plus employees over the past few years. So if you, if they weren't doing that and they were just kind of jumping right to, you know, humanity, not not acknowledging the the different identities first, right? Um, you're not you you're missing pieces that like are, are needed. You're you're not meeting the needs of, of the employees. So I really like her takeaways because I think it illustrates, it really highlights the the need for a balance of both and not, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean it, and it I it also I don't know for me it highlights also like the need, the need to make sure that we're well certainly so what you said, Sarah is not it's not just important to create superordinate and make salient superordinate identities but also to make salient our individual unique identities both as individuals and as group members so that's important and those experience associated with those so all of that's important but then also i think sometimes when we talk about power dynamics it's very easy to go well we only need to consider the needs of the disempowered um, and this is actually saying well we also need to consider if we want real change we need to consider everyone's needs here um, and I think that's important too, because I think the quote unquote empowered group or person or whomever sometimes feels like they're, well, what about me? Like, like I'm a person too. I have needs too, you know, that kind of thing. And, and so I think that's important. And, I, and also in, in certain situations where it's like not as clear cut as like the boss and the employee, 
but it's like two groups of two social groups in in some sort of society. It's like sometimes it's not as clear cut who's the empowered because maybe one group views them as the empowered, but then they view themselves as disempowered or it's, it's kind of more complex than that in some way. And so like, who's to say who's in power? And, and so sometimes that happens, you know, and then sometimes individuals within a particular power group feel way more disempowered than let's say individuals in the disempowered group who feel much more empowered or something. So it, there's a lot of nuance here. So I think it's, I think I like this, uh, the idea of like, we need to consider everyone's needs here as group members and also as individuals, not just the not just the disempowered, which is I think is sometimes mostly focused on. If we want real change, you know, if we want, because otherwise it's just, you know, it, it, it seems unsustainable. Yeah, agreed. Which is why, yeah, the, back to like the balance. There needs to be um, attention and and support, tolerance, acceptance paid to all beings. Yeah. Hmm. So like. Realistically, what does this look like? So say for instance, so like let's just use PPS as an example. And so then say, Jeremy, um, a group was started within PPS for the LGBTQ that, you know, so that they could have, you know, that space. And then say all of your African-American people just wanted a group. And then your Latina or Hispanic um, peace builders wanted a group. Like, how do we do that? How does an organization do that? And do it where it's equitable, where, but where everyone has a chance to find their group or to make their group, like logistically and realistically, how do we help people do that? And then like, how far does it go? So like, does yeah. anyone like, well, I want to start a group for people that love jazz, you know, and well, no, you know, I want a trap music group. So, because that's how I identify. And so like, like I said, just like, how do, how do we do this? How do we do this? Um, and how do we help organizations do this in a way that is like you already said, sustainable, but where it is effective and where people aren't feeling left out. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of, of organizations creating affinity groups um, because I think they can be very exclusive and non-inclusive. And I don't think that that's necessarily healthy for an organization. Certainly, you, anybody can do whatever they want outside of work. But um, I think having groups where it's like focused on a topic, but it's, but it's like anybody can join. Because I think the minute where we start going, well, if you're not part of my group, then you can't join. I think that's very. I could. I think that's actually leading us leading us away from progress. To me, in my my opinion, I've actually we've we've been approached before with companies that have like large budgets to say, hey, we want we want to create these trainings, but we want to do them in infinity groups with like you know all one group in training and all this group in training. And I and I've turned it down. I said I'm not. That's not something that we can do. You know, I just don't think that that's making progress towards you know towards in, inclusivity and in you know and and, and just general, you know, I don't know, <laughs> certainly, you know, you can do that outside, but, um, you know, yeah. this, is, this is interesting. It's making me think of, I just saw my, my little cousin off to college this last week and she went to one of those, um, you know, like the freshman kind of orientation where they have all the clubs and the groups and they're trying to get people to join their club. And, it's all about affinity groups, but based on topics, right? Based on, based like, on top. what your interests, what your interests are. But there are also um, more advocacy groups, right? For certain minority groups within within the the larger structure of the school, and just seeing that is and now now it, it kind of thinking about the workplace. I, Jeremy, just in response to what you're saying, I'm kind of seeing. I'm picking up what you're putting down, right? Because it's like in a in a workplace, by having these subgroups within, it's a lot. It's not the same as a as a undergraduate university with yeah. young kids still trying to like discover themselves and 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 figure out what their interests are. Uh, excuse me. Um, 
yeah I, i'm i'm starting to see that like how how in a workplace doing that could could further divide however if there is if we look at like the first key takeaway here meeting the employee needs if the needs are greater for a certain group i think then that's a different story right then then you have to like within an organization if the needs for lgbtq plus community um because they're feeling whether it be discriminated against like within the organization or not, the need is greater there. Yes, it's important to, to, to listen to everyone, but perhaps there's a little bit more support or a focus group discussion or, or some, or, or, you know, in order to decipher what the need is. Okay. Is it, um, you know, you want to share more knowledge because you're feeling like there's microaggressions within the organization. Are you not getting the adequate pay? Is there not like a, um, is there a, you know, you're getting less and you feel like it's because of that, you know, whatever the need is, I think that, that is a different conversation, but meeting these, these affinity groups is just, just because there are different groups within a, t a, t a workplace I can see how that would be further dividing everyone and it's not really leading to, you know. Yeah. Well, one, one, one thing that it seems to be lacking in our, in our strategies today, not, not just at the organization, but at a social level too, is like, we, we come up with these ideas that sort of seem like good ideas or sound good, but we, but we don't have a clear goal or outcome in mind and we don't have any clear. And because of that, we don't have any clear ways of measuring whether we're achieving it. And so if like, if a company was to say, well, we want to create these, these types of groups or something, I, so I would say, well, okay, so what's your goal with those, with creating that? Like, what's the outcome you're wanting and how are we measuring it? So that we know that if we create the groups, we're actually achieving that. Cause if you don't have, cause, cause you might be having, you might be getting the opposite effect. So we should make sure, you know, that kind of stuff. So, and I, so in me, for me, it's like, when you talk about organizations creating affinity groups, I'm not clear on what kind of goal we would have for that. Like what would certainly if, if there's like, let's say there's a, there's an organ, there's a company that says, Hey, we want to create a, uh, we want to create a group. That's all about talking about the LGBTQ experience. And that's what the topic of the group is, but everybody's welcome to come, to come to it. Yeah. Right. It's not like you got to be LGBTQ to come to it. Like that seems very exclusive because, th because then it's like, you're opening up a world of like, okay, well, like, let's have only white male, there's a white male group, and only white males can come to us. Like, that's not cool, right? It's like, so, so what are we, what are we trying to do here? And, it's, you know, if we're saying, oh, it's only, it's only okay for certain groups to do that, but not for other certain groups, it opens up this kind of can of worms that I just don't think is very useful. And it does create more division. So, I mean, I, I'm all for topic groups, but, but like, let's keep it inclusive. Let's keep, let's let everybody come in. I was thinking about this because it was like, uh, you know, out in the world, outside of organizations, we can, people do whatever they want. They can create affinity groups all they want, you know, it's, you know but um, <clears throat> I was thinking about, I went to a temple out here just cause I'm looking to maybe like, you know, connect with other, you know, uh, the, the people in the Jewish community. And, uh, and they, you know, my wife's not Jewish. And so they, and they told me, you know, that's fine. Like, well, everybody's welcome. Like, come on in, you know, like we're, we're going to do a temple. We're going to have a little breakfast afterwards. It's because everybody's, everybody's welcome, you know, like anybody that wants to come. And I, and I, and I thought to myself, the minute that I, if I ever joined a temple and they said, well, only Jews, Jews are allowed to come. I'd just be like, that's not the right temple for me. Cause that doesn't feel inclusive. Like I'm, it's all, this is the topic. Judaism is the topic and that's the sort of connection, but everyone's welcome. That's cool for me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, that seems like a more inclusive way of doing, I don't know if I'm going to call them fitted groups, but more topic related groups. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think if you were to implement something like that, I think the important thing is to make sure that you have this underlying need of safety met from the members that are sharing their lived experiences. So that'd be the main thing that I would, that I would very much focus on if you were to create a topic group for like LGBTQ people, rather than having an LGBTQ like exclusive group was just right. making sure that how it's facilitated is a space where you're not going to get any pushback for your lived experiences because, you know, mm. some, you need that, you need that shared connection. So you need, you need the, you need the safety of the group to be able to, to know that it's okay to talk about that. And it's not going to be like challenged and pushed back. Like that's the point of the group. Exactly. Yeah. And there's, there's trauma there too. So it's like, it, it can open up a lot of internal stuff. So I think it, you know, you have to have 
right. if you're going to have the topic base, it needs to be facilitated inclusively um, for those for that safety kind of need to be met. And then going back to like what Sarah said about undergrad clubs, <clears throat> I was a graduate assistant. Um, that was actually my job. I helped with um, the student organizations and like the purpose for those student organizations was for students to come together to have a safe space and for other people to also come in and see like, oh, like, let me learn something. And I think that's also really important as well to let these people like who might need like a space to feel safe, to, but also let other people come and understand where they're coming from. So it, it, they're, they're um, set up just as Jeremy was speaking, like very inclusive to where, you know, whether you identify with this group or not, you're still welcome to join the club yeah. or whatever, you know, in order to learn as a learning mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. And also just making sure that people are, have like a designated space where they can find like community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And having, having a, creating a culture for each of those groups. So each of those groups has their own standards and expectations. They have their own code of civility, code of conduct, so that mm -hmm. you know they know that it's a safe space to voice whatever their experiences are without mm -hmm. feeling like, you know, psychological, like they might be attacked or shamed or something like that. Yeah, being protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds like we figured out how to do it then. Oh, we figured it all out. Yeah. <laughs>